All right, guys, welcome to the Winner's Circle on the It's More Than Just Money uh, YouTube channel. Remember, if you haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button, click on the notifications bell, show us some love, especially if you are learning at least one thing from this channel. We're bringing in people that are achieving phenomenal stuff, be it in the property industry, in business, in their career, and we want them to share a lot of what they've done with us so that we can gather some lessons and use those lessons to also build up our lives. And it's what I wish for you as, as the viewer, you know. So this morning, it's morning where I am, I've got a phenomenal, phenomenal gentleman. I reached out to him because I love his content, his diverse kind of content. And I want him to share his story with, with us and give us some tips on, on how to do what he does. So his name is Aslam Tutoit. Uh, so he's a networker, he's a website developer, he's a property developer. He started his property journey in the year 2003. He has been in commercial, commercial banking, uh, I think for about 16 years now. Uh, he created a network called the 925 Millionaire. Uh, this is where corporate workers, professionals, and self-employed business people connect. So he's a, he's a networker and a connector of people. He shares his tip on how to make passive income on the 9 to 5. Yeah, 9 to 5. Judy, yeah, whether you have a job, <laughs> man, you can still make money even if you have a 9 to 5, right? Yeah. Because that's what I was doing. Welcome. Thank you for, Thanks, man. for agreeing to have this conversation with me, with me. I said to you, this is going to be a conversation. Yeah. And, and I want people to get to know I know a lot of people already know who you are, uh, but there's a, a wider audience of people mm. that might be interested in your story. Um, and who are you, man? And why are you everywhere telling people to invest in property, start business, change their <laughs> mindset? Why is that important to you? You know, I, I think when you feel that you have a calling in life, you just, it, it's like you can't keep it. It's, it's like a message you have on your inside and you just can't keep it to yourself, right? So I, it's not something that started now. I think it started with this thing over here, you know, reading books. Sure. And I think my journey started when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Sure, same here as uh, well. Yeah. Robert Kiyosaki and uh, I, I had just finished varsity. I had no idea what I wanted to do after school. Uh, I thought I'm gonna become a chef. A chef? <laughs> a chef, man, because <laughs> I, I actually enjoy being in the kitchen, but I, I realized I don't like cooking for other people. I like cooking for myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it's fine. Uh, you know, I love it when people enjoy the food, like the family, but I can't do it. I had a business where we used to cook food and I didn't want to be in the kitchen. I like dressing like this here. I don't For like sure. looking like a chef. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought I'm, that's the route I'm going to go. And uh, I ended up studying a, a degree. I did a, a, a BCom degree. And even then, I had no idea what I was going to do. I got a job in finance and I came across the book, uh, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And yeah. when I read the book, it was a mind changer. You know, I, I thought, wow, no one ever taught me this. You know, uh, what is, I never heard about passive income. So since then, I've just been on this journey, figuring things out. You know, we don't always have the answers because um, we don't have mentors to teach us that. If you didn't come from a family where you were being taught about money or wealth creation, you know, you were taught you need to get, go to school, get good grades, get a good job and then work. Yeah. My father used to always say, once you get your degree, work in government. <laughs> in government. <laughs> That's what he used to tell me, you know, get a, and, and you must understand it was their mindset, right? Yeah. Because to them, it's a, it was like, if you get a job in government, you get good perks. That was his whole thing. Sure. You're going to get good perks. And, and you uh, didn't follow that advice? No, 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 no. I didn't get into government. <laughs> but after I, I, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it just, I just wanted to share that message, you know, of building passive income. And since that time, I was like telling people, you know, we should invest in property. We should, uh, you know, try to build passive income because we don't know our jobs might not be forever. True. You know, uh, and whether you like it or not, even if you don't, um, you know, you're going to retire at some point. And even at retirement, after retirement, what do people do? They have no idea what to do. Mm. So I feel if people should be developing skills, even though they are working nine to fives, because that's what I was doing. I was building skills and those skills eventually, you know, give you the goals that you want. So how long ago was this? I mean, yeah. it's, you just finished 
Matric and you you went you uh, went varsity, to varsity, varsity yes. finished varsity you're not getting a job yeah. eventually you get into finance yeah I worked for a credit insurance company and then what prompted you to I mean to you don't just pick up a book and read it it's because there's something so in good. you that prompts you to want to read that particular book it's a funny story actually in that company that I was working at <laughs> they were I always laugh when I think back this I'm talking the year 2000. Yeah. That's so that's the year when you started working. Got my first job in 2000. Yeah. Hey, you had a lot of salaries, eh? <sighs> Man, too many. <laughs> <laughs> so I was working I was a financial analyst <clears throat> at this company. So we was assessing financial statements of companies. Uh, that's why I know so many companies sometimes you look at my content there's a lot of companies that I know right yeah. because I was analyzing their financials and giving credit recommendations on those companies. So that's why I'm aware of so many companies. But uh, we had a general manager sitting on the floor and he called me into his office one day and I'll never forget the conversation. First thing he asked me is he said uh, he asked me do you have a house? I said no I don't have a house. He said, "Okay, uh, get yourself a house." He says, "But the moment you have a house, here's what I want you to do. Mm. I want you to start investing on the stock market." Now, even though I had studied finance, we didn't learn how to invest on the stock market. So I was like, "Okay." He's like, "He says, you see, I'm a general manager. Don't aspire to become like me." Sure. And I won't tell you the words that he used, but he said to me, "I make more on the stock market than I make in this." I'll say place but that's not what he called it. And I couldn't understand that because isn't that what you ex- you don't expect that to be told to you by your boss's boss. Yeah. You know so I didn't understand this and then I I was like okay so I asked him what do you mean he said my he said his son is an asset manager and he invests in shares on the stock market. So I thought man I still have a study loan I can't even think about investing on the stock market. <laughs> you know because I was paying my study loan. Yeah. Well, and he, and if says Uh, no it wasn't that that was actually yeah. he had a study loan from FNB at the time mm-hmm. you know and uh, i had to pay this and then one, once i paid the study loan i really had money left <laughs> because yeah. my salary was so small and this man started something amongst a few of the youngsters in the in the in the department he called it the learning organization and he would take us every wednesday afternoon and we would go into a boardroom similar to where we're sitting now and he would speak about investing in shares and at the time we didn't have cell phones smartphones and things so what he did was he made us open the newspaper and you know at the back of the newspaper would be all the share prices listed in the newspaper i remember that yeah. you, you you know that i'm talking way back and then he would tell us to select a dummy share portfolio we must go and select shares from the newspaper and we must come and tell him the following week why we bought shares in that company so he was teaching us all this and in that learning organization session there was a girl that had the book rich dad poor dad and she started speaking about this book and when she started speaking about it i was very intrigued by what i was hearing because these were new concepts to me i had no idea what they were speaking about yeah and then i asked her can you bring me that book i want to read it and she brought the book i i used it for like two days and i realized this is a book i want to finish but i didn't feel good about keeping the book <laughs> So what I did was I took the book and I went to the company's photocopy machine <laughs> and I photocopied the whole book <laughs> and I stapled it together and I I read the book and that's that's where I, I, and I was I was highlighting you know how you would highlight in a textbook yeah. I was highlighting things like in a textbook and I thought I need to apply this but it wasn't until years later so that was 2000 it wasn't until 2003 or four when I actually bought my first investment property because I was just hungry to apply what I was learning in the book you know investing in property and mm-hmm. that's that's how that started it started from that experience so it wasn't even something that was there burning or because I had no idea what I wanted to do you sure. know so that's actually what happened it had a profound impact on my mindset and my thinking and then how do you move from that mm. you in credit analyzing deals and then you bought your first property basically you, you became a property investor yeah and you know it's, was, it's funny was it a home to live in or was it uh, just a property for you to invest in so after i left that company uh, i left that company in 2002 and then i became a credit analyst at uh, the turquoise bank T- turquoise okay yeah 
Yeah. I became a, as a credit analyst there and I worked there for about, I think it was about 18 months. Mm-hmm. And even up until that point, I wasn't, I was, I hadn't invested in anything. I didn't, I hadn't bought shares. I hadn't bought anything. And uh, then I only bought my first car then. So it was like the time you're a young guy, all your friends have cars. And I was finally like, thank God I can buy a car. And why I couldn't buy a car. Why? Because I had a study loan. Sure. So when I left that company, guess what I did? I took my pension to pay off the study loan. True. Okay. And that was like the biggest goal I, I had at the time. So I, I paid that off. And then I moved to the Red Bank as a credit analyst again. Mm-hmm. And I was assessing deals. And one of the deals that I was assessing was uh, a developer that we were financing was building townhouses in the West Rand in an uh, area called Volkhevo. Oh, Volkhevo, yeah. Yeah. And that time, these developments were just starting. And the banker I was working with, I asked him, I said, can I buy a unit in this development? You know, and he said, I don't see why not. And uh, the, the developer gave me a discount on the price, which we were not actually allowed to get because I was working in the bank at the time. Yeah. But we declared it, you know, so I, I invited a friend of mine. This was where I first learned about having a partner. And I told my friend about it because I don't want to do it on my own. So he bought the were you unit. Scared? I was a bit scared, you know, <laughs> when you're doing your first investment. So I was a bit scared. And then uh, I told him, you know, you buy a unit and I'll buy a unit. So I bought a unit. In fact, I put my name down for two units. I was going to buy two units. It's one of my biggest regrets that I let someone talk me out of buying two units. Because the only deposit we had to put down was 2,500 rand. Yeah. We were buying them off plan at the time. Yeah. No transfer fees, no bond no registration fees, fees. etc. You know? Yeah. So in my mind, I was going to live in one and rent the other one out. That was my initial plan. Then I, I had some money stored away in an investment because I'd been saving. I had about 10,000 10, rand stored away. And the lady who had our, the investment stored was working on our floor. And I walked into our office and I said, listen, that investment, I need to unlock that capital. Because I'm putting it down as a, I'm putting money down as a deposit on these two units, yeah. and she asked me, "Do you really want to buy two? You're exposing yourself." And I let this lady talk me out of buying two units. Naysayers, my brother, <laughs> don't let naysayers, uh, you know, take you away from your dream. Because when I look back, if I had bought two units, those unit prices at that time had increased so much, I could have sold the one and paid off the other one. And I would have had a paid off unit in no time. So that sure. would have been a brilliant strategy. So it's one of my biggest regrets, you know? So we, especially when you're young, don't be fearful. You know, that's a lesson that I'll, I'll tell people. Don't be fearful because you can always recover. You know, when it's I look good. at where my salary was in that year, 2003, to where it eventually got 10 years later, 15 years later, I was earning significantly more. So even if things had gone bad, I would have made it out of the hole, Yeah, you know? And uh, yeah, so I bought one unit and uh, the unit wasn't built. I mean, I couldn't even see when I went to go and have a look at the property. Guess it was just land. <laughs> <laughs> I went, I'm like, okay. So I, mean, I was walking on the land there on the dust and I was like, so where's my unit going to be? No, it's going to be upstairs. And I was like, oh, okay. And in my mind, I'm picturing this is where my unit's going to be. Yeah. So I bought the unit and it took about 12 to 18 months to build. And in 2004, I took transfer. And uh, at that point... I had actually then changed jobs again because I was working in four ways. So when I was working in four ways, uh, no, sorry, not in four ways, in Santon, I think. And then we moved, the, uh, the bank moved the offices to four ways. So I thought, okay, it will be good for me to live in this unit. But then I got another job and I had to move to the CBD. And I thought, no, but now I have to travel all the way from there to come into the CBD. So I, I stayed where I was. And then I said, I'll just rent out the unit when I took transfer. So that's how I started renting out that unit. And it was my best unit. That unit bought me two fish and chip franchises. Wow. Years later. Mm. And it was my best purchase. How did you do that? Refinancing? Refinancing. Yeah. Yeah. You we'll know, get into that later. We'll, yeah, we'll get into that, right? So, uh, and, and that's why I say, you know, when I still look back, I was like, I should have had two units. I should have had two units. But anyhow, I bought you the unit. you would have had four fish and chip franchi- franchises. <laughs> yeah, but those... <laughs> I have, I, have, I have my other have reservations, reservations now about fish, uh, <laughs> not even fish and chips, but just like franchises in general. I know a lot of people want to start them. I'm not for them. Uh, there's many reasons. We might get into that. We might not. But uh, that was basically the journey. And I bought the unit. I started renting it out. And I'll never forget my, when I told my father I'm buying a property to rent out. He said, why are you buying property to rent out? People are going to damage your property. 
I almost didn't buy the property as well because of that. So also be careful who you listen to. You know, this, I mean, your, your own father, you know, and remember they grew up in a different time. So when you're becoming an entrepreneur, you and I spoke about this before our session here. Mindset is going to be your biggest challenge. And when I say mindset, I'm talking about belief systems. Because what have you been told as a child about money? If you've been told over and over your whole life, don't invest in, don't buy property because people are going to damage your property. Yeah, then you, you won't end buy up not do it. You won't buy it because you're going to be scared. So we as parents and as children of parents, we actually are the architects of either our children's success or their disaster. Yeah. Because you are, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are giving them the tools to work with in their minds. Because remember, the, the body is only doing what the mind has already thought about. Sure. You know, everything we do, you, it was a thought first. They say thoughts are things. So if you allow those thoughts to become things in the things that you do, you'll never do it. So that's what happened. I bought the property. I started. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. Somehow, somehow, the, 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 the knowledge that I got from reading that book circumvented what I was told by my father. I don't, I don't, my father's still alive. I'm thankful. God bless, you know, that I still have a father. He's 82 years old. But some things you just don't listen to your parents. You just go and you do your own thing in your life. You know, you find your, you blast your own trail. Mm. And uh, that was the, the, the journey, the first year in 2004. And then I searched and searched and, you know, eventually I started building up and eventually I had 10 units, residential units that I was renting out years later. Yeah. That was like a 10 year journey. So you've got a, <clears throat> in those 10 years and even more years after that, you've had a diverse kind of a career. Mm. I mean, you've been, you've been an entrepreneur, you've started a property investment portfolio you've done network marketing mm. you've been in banking you've been in commercial banking so mm. what is the one thing that you could say was the most prevalent in terms of in terms of your mindset from starting to where you are now where you can say i picked mm. up this mindset then mm. i still have it now and i see it helping me for the rest of my career so you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a good question and it's a hard question to answer because I was just ignorance on fire. I didn't ignorance know. Ignorance on fire. I was ignorance on fire. Okay. Uh, and, and there's something else. I'm, uh, so I'm a, I'm a bit of a textbook when it comes to quotes and, you know, it's things that I've heard over the years. Yeah. And uh, I once heard that uh, ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. Sure. So you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you're not doing anything with it and you're not taking any action, then what's the use of having all that knowledge? You know, so it's good to get education. I'm a firm believer of getting education. But when you get education, be critical about the education and the things that you are learning and ask yourself how you can apply things. I don't like learning something that I cannot apply. And that was that's my biggest gripe with even though I have degrees, I did a BCom, I did an honors degree. But even though I have these formal qualifications, mm. I feel they teach you, they don't teach you much. Because you've got a degree, but what, what can you actually do? They don't teach you how to do something. You're better off going and learning plumbing. At least you know how to fix a tap. Yeah. And you can charge someone for fixing a tap. Now, when you've yeah. got a BCom, what can you charge people for? You can't charge them for business advice because what business advice are you going to give you them? Start? What you learned in the textbook. Yeah. That's not real advice. Real advice is what, you, what you've done. So for me, because I've done things in property, I would much rather teach people what I learned in property because I've actually done it than teach them what I learned in a textbook. So when I was doing all these things, I was, it, I was doing different things because I didn't have an answer. I was running around in a maze trying to find what is going to work. True. You know, so even network marketing, I, I, I really got serious about it in 2014. That's why I did personal development, but I was initially introduced to it in 2004 or five, somewhere around there. I, you know, there's a company called Amway, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, with those expensive products. And I, I was in there for like a day and I was like, I can't sell toothpaste that costs 200 rand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I was joined. Where did that come from? That desire to want to join network marketing uh, because I, I it's a sales-based industry it's sales-based you see yeah. the problem people everyone wants to get into property but the thing that they don't realize yeah. especially with the properties i was buying those things are very really cash positive like i get a lot of messages where people are like i'm buying a townhouse 
and I'm going to rent it out. Negative cash flow sometimes. Always. Yeah. Always. I put my head on a block that 100% of the time it's going to be negative cash flow. Yeah. But at the time I didn't understand the concept because I was buying into what people were saying. Oh, if you buy a property, it's going to increase in value over 10 years. You don't invest because something is going to increase in value over 10 years. You invest because it can make you cash flow immediately. Yeah. You know, if it's not making cash flow immediately, it's simple. It's a liability. Well, it did eventually buy you two franchises. So they were But right. that one was cash positive. From, from it the was start a cash. because you got it cheaper. Because I got it cheaper. You got a discount. Yes. Plus I got, uh, yeah, I got like a discount on the property. I got a 20% discount on the purchase yeah, price. Yeah, and it only registered two years later. So Yes. At that time, time remember, we were in a boom. I bought before the boom. Remember, when did the market collapse? 2008. 2008. Yeah. Yeah. By that time, my property had already doubled in value. Hmm. So I was fine, you understand. So I, I sure. wasn't, and my rental, even when I refinanced it years later, even though I refinanced, my rental was still covering two bonds and the levy. So it was still cash, cash was flow still positive. Cash flow positive. After refinancing. After refinancing. Did you refinance the total value or eighty percent of it? Maybe up to about eighty percent. So yeah. I was, I was. Very Can you just quickly explain what refinancing means? Uh, maybe someone is mm. listening to you and, you and I and is probably thinking, what jargon is this? Yeah. Are these guys okay. speaking? So, so refinancing, in, uh, in the simplest terms, that's how you get rich in property, number one. That's how you get rich in property. That's the beauty of property. So, for example, it's basically you buy a property today. The income is 6,000 rand. So maybe you can get a loan for, say, 600,000. Or let, let's just say the property, you bought it for 600000 you're collecting 6000 So you've got one bond on the property. Refinance, let's say years later, your rental has now gone up to seven or 8000 rand, mm. which means you can take a second bond on the property and take out some equity. So you don't need to sell it. Some people will think about selling the property, but you don't necessarily need to sell it. You refinance it with the bank. The bank now maybe gives you another 100, 200,000 above the original loan, and you can take that capital and you can put it into another deal or into a business. Do you pay tax on that 100,000? You don't pay tax on that because it's not an income, it's debt. So it's free money. It's free money. Okay. It's other people's okay. money. So then you use that to either buy another property or start another business. Yeah, you use that to invest. So that's what my clients used to do in, 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 in the bank, you know. Uh, when it's I what was, you were seeing on a daily basis. I was seeing that on a daily basis on a very big scale because I was financing guys in the commercial property space. Mm -hmm. So they, when they were refinancing, we're not talking an extra 100,000, you know, it would be millions. Sure. You know, where they would refinance existing properties and they would be taking that and buying another shopping center. Because the so rental has gone up. The rental has gone up. And that is actually one of the biggest reasons I, I'm not a big fan of residential. Sure. Because when I was investing in residential, Residential, you're always getting funding more often than not through the home loans division of the bank. Most of the time. The problem yeah. with the home loans division of the bank is they're always looking at your salary, not at the income of the property. True. You know, and I was, I was having a problem with that eventually because I had 10 properties. I was renting them out. They were cash. You know, when I balanced it all out, they were making money. Yeah. But so you're getting like, if, if it was 6,000 each, you're getting like 60K over those... Yes, units. yeah, we had all these units and I was asking for further debt from the bank and the bank was like, you overextended. I'm like, how? I'm not paying a cent out of my salary into these properties. So yeah. how am I? But the problem with the home loan division, and I don't know if they still do this because I'm out of the, I, I don't deal with them anymore. What they would do is, let's say your income on rental was 20,000. They would maybe only take 50 to 60% of that as an income. Yeah. So they might only say only 10,000 is an income. And I would be like, but I collect 20,000. Look at my bank statements. It comes in month after month. And they would be like, no, we only take 50 or 60%. And then they would take the full expenses off. So obviously now when they calculate your cash flow position, they say yeah, you are negative. Cash flow negative yeah. And I'm like, no, but in real terms, I am not cash flow negative. That's when I realized these are, and it was not even about buying properties. At first I thought it's because I'm buying in my own name. Then I started buying in companies and I still had the same problem. The problem wasn't the, the, the structure that I was using. The problem was the type of properties I was buying. As long as you're buying residential, you sit with that problem. So that's why I'm, I'm more in favor of commercial because when, when I was in the commercial space, we never ever asked the guy for his salary. Mm. 
We don't ask you for your salary in the commercial space. We ask you for your personal assets and liability statement. That's what we ask you for. So we want to see how much assets do you have and how liabilities, and we're looking at your net asset value. And when we look at the income... So are you borrowing against the net, net asset value? Not, uh, that's just so the company can make... That's just so the bank can make sure that, uh, you know, you, you have a, a good net asset value relative to the amount of debt that you want to raise. But ultimately, when they determining affordability, they're mm -hmm. looking at the rental income from the property. They're not looking at whether your salary can pay. So every time I get queries from people online, it's always, they're always telling me their credit score. Yeah, nobody cares what your credit score I, is when you're buying really commercial building. I don't pay building. attention to a credit. I just make sure your credit report is clean, that it's you don't clean. have defaults. Yeah. But yeah. I don't care whether your credit score is five or 100. If you're buying a building that has rental income and you're going to the commercial division of a bank, they're not going to look at your income. Unless, they, unless you, they're contemplating giving you a loan over and above normal lending criteria, which they don't normally do. You know, but as long as they stay within the criteria and you have the deposit to put down for the balance, they're mm. not even going to ask you how much you earn at your job. Mm. And a lot of people don't know that. So yeah. what are the other things that you've noticed that you think are not for the everyday layman mm. to know and understand about the property industry, especially commercial property industry? <sighs> Look, I just think commercial property in general, it's a very, I always tell some of my coaching students that it's a it's a shrouded industry there's not much knowledge shrouded. Going around. what does that mean shrouded behind an umbrella so there's a there's a bit of a curtain when it comes to the commercial property there's a space base, there's, a, there's a veil that's a better word yeah. there is a veil right and the veil is basically hiding some of what you know you don't see it like there's information and there's still some information that i can't share true you yeah. know look it's understandable it's because no one wants extra competition and there will always be things that we probably will never reveal in terms of, you know, the commercial deals. But I believe that there's a very big opportunity for people to get into to the commercial space. I think we need to take people beyond the belief that property investing just means buying a house and renting out a house or a townhouse. Yeah, we must get out of that belief. You, you, you understand. And I saw this when I was also in the bank. I, I remember having a client where I went to see this huge property, an industrial property. Uh, I had this on one of my webinars uh, two weeks ago and I was explaining this. It was amazing because I found that that property had 100 investors, mm. but it was a property that was worth about 200 million. Because here's another way to think about it. This is why I love commercial, besides how you raise finance against that commercial property. The other thing is, the amount of time sometimes it takes you to do a residential property, you could might as just as well have done a commercial. So would you rather be a 20% shareholder in a 100 million rand property or would you rather be a 100% shareholder in a 700,000 rand property? That's the question you got to ask yourself, you know, because mm -hmm. if you buy something worth five, 50 million, for example, and you're only a, only a 10% shareholder, it's worth 5 million. It's 5 million, yeah. You understand? So... We need to just get beyond the belief that property commercial is only for the big guys. No, most commercial property, if you look at it, everything around you, many of them, it's not owned by one person. It's owned more, more often than not by it's consortiums consortium, yeah. or families of people. You'll find maybe, uh, you know, especially like in the Indian communities, you'll find a family, they're running multiple businesses and they buy property that is not just meant for the father. It's for the kids, it's for the uncle, it's for the brother, it's for the grandkids, it's for everyone. You know, and that's how you build a uh, wealth. Sure. You know, getting around, around the right community of people and network of people. And either you create that network within your own circle or you build a circle like you and I now, we've met each other. Why can't we, with our network, do a commercial property deal? Mm. You know, we, you, you know, instead of us individually doing a 1 million rand deal, why don't we do a 10 million rand deal? Mm. Because to your point of refinancing, now when we refinance, we're not raising a couple of hundred thousand. You're raising maybe, millions. We're raising two, three million rent. Now we can go and buy another one. Yeah. You know, so that is the, the only thing about commercial property. And that's honestly what I'm seeking, the, the gap I'm seeking to bridge. Because as a deal maker in the bank, one of the, my jobs was to go out and find business. But you know where the problem is? There weren't many people who were doing this kind of business. There weren't many people doing commercial property. Yeah. So I changed banks three times. I worked for three different banks. How did you circumvent 
the lack mm. of people that are doing this thing. Did you start? We don't out? run after the same clients. <laughs> oh, Everyone's running after the same clients. Yeah. It's, it's too incestuous. So what I would find, for example, I would be in one bank and I would have a certain clientele. Then I would move to another bank and I would think I'm going to go to the same client to do the same deal, you know, that I did for him at the previous bank. But then the guy says, oh, no, at this bank, I already deal with this guy. So then it started becoming very hard for me because what I found was that they wanted me to go and find new business. How did a black man like you find new business? In a, yeah, in the commercial property space. Is, yeah, because is, 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 I'm is imagining a very, that a lot of the people that were doing that kind of work. Yeah were predominantly white. Predominantly, meaning, more than 90%. Meaning there weren't many people that you would have grown up with or mm. known to be in that kind of business anyway. So how did you actually come up with ways to get those clients, especially from scratch? You know what? In, in the first bank, it wasn't really a case of me going out and finding the clients. It was a very, they had a very good structure. They had a structure. Where you were, you were allocated a portfolio. And uh, in that case, a business center, what we call the business center. And you were the guy responsible for any property deal that came through that business center. And you didn't matter. Okay. Didn't matter. You were allocated there. In other banks, it doesn't work like that. You need to go out and hunt, which is very hard. So most yeah. of my friends, ex-colleagues, they, many of them are not hunters. And that's why I saw the, the, the problem when I moved to the other banks, because I was like, uh, the bank doesn't really want to deal with new people. But I'll be honest with you. Most of the banks don't want to deal with new clients. You they, know, want the they want experienced people. But how do you people. become an experienced commercial property investor if you've never done deals? So what I've been seeking to do is to bridge the gap. So if you come to me and you don't have experience in commercial, I'll look at your deal and I'll say, okay, how can I panel beat this deal before it goes to the bank to make sure that it can get over the line for finance, mm -hmm. to make it pretty enough and attractive enough for the bank. Mm. You see that that's what I've been trying to do through the platform that I've created. Yeah. But to your asking me the, the, the whole thing about how did I get clients? I didn't have to in the first bank. Um, and then what did help was, you know, my surname is Dutoy, so <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny thing. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, but it was a funny thing because what, what the, yeah. one of the first jobs I had, they gave me the whole of Limpopo province to look after. Because of your surname? No, just because the person left, the person who was living in Polokwane yeah. had left and I needed to, they needed to appoint someone else. Yes. And they appointed me to look after Polokwane. My brother, I drove all the way to Messina to see clients, Palaborua, Ellis Ras on the other side. I went to all those places, Zanin, uh, all those places. And when I would send meeting requests to some of the, the people on that side, because it's mostly a white, you know, uh, mostly the, uh, the white community that owned the property. Yeah. It would say, Aid hey, Toy. And then I, put your full in, name, then, your I would, name. then I would walk into the office and the guy would look at the card again or the email again. And, like, are you Mr. Dutoy? <laughs> and and it, it would be a, actually it would be a, it was always a great icebreaker. It yeah. was a great then icebreaker. You have to tell a story. Then I have to tell a story. So I built some good uh, relationships there. It was always a story because it would always be who can I say you do You know. And my second language is Afrikaans, not my first language. You know. So it was always a funny story. So I guess that helped a little bit just to you know. And I, I had some very nice clients, especially in Ellis Ras. There was a man there that uh, I was really fond of, and I know he was very fond of me. You know, we did some really nice deals there. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of these people must have been some of your teachers and mentors. Yeah. Can you get more into that? Tell me the things that you've learned from them. It's interesting that you ask that question. That's the reason I got into, I remember I, I was a credit analyst. Yes. Right. So why did I be, go into property? Because I thought it's rich that put it. No, no. So what <laughs> happened was, in 2004, five-ish, around there, yeah. I had already bought my first property. I wanted to make another investment. I came across uh, a piece of land that I thought would be great for a shopping center. And I started looking at this thing and I started engaging once again in ignorance on fire. And I got to a certain point where I even had spa that had said they're interested in be, uh, becoming a tenant in the building. I got my friend who was an architectural student <laughs> to design the shopping center. Mm. Uh, all with no, I was doing this with no money. And eventually where I needed the money was to secure the land. And I couldn't secure the land. That's how I lost the deal. So I, I just told myself, I need to start learning about property now. 
So then I started trying to get into the commercial property division of the bank. That's why I got in. That's why I started pursuing getting in there because I to work in there because I didn't study property. I I had I had no knowledge about property, and I thought the only way I'm going to learn this is if I maybe work in the industry. And I realized the bank has this division, and I th- I started applying, and eventually three four years later I got in there, and. When I got in there, my whole thing was I'm going to learn from the people that are going to become my clients, and that's to that me was strategic. Eh? That was very strategic because every time I would go out and see a client, to me it was I'm interviewing this guy to see how he started, what he did, how his business is structured, because I wanted to basically look for blueprints of how these people are doing these deals. What was the common thing that you were getting from all of them? Like what was when you were doing these question and answer mm. sessions, these interviews, what's the most common thing amongst all these successful property developers okay. and investors? You know so for, for, for the guys that were developers, a lot of them it was sort of a historical thing where they've been in it maybe through a family, maybe the father was doing it and they just came in and took over. Sure. You know, and they learned the game like that. Some of them maybe were working in construction or they were quantity surveyors or, you know, there were some sort of professionals and they eventually became. But in more cases than I can remember, it was always a case of the guy would normally have another business that he was running mm. that was actually a cash generator for him. It could be a wholesaler. It could be a steel business. It could be any, any, other, any business. And they were basically taking their money and putting it into property. So I then realized that property wasn't really the wealth creator. It was the wealth magnifier for mm. a lot of them. And it was where they would store their wealth, not where they really created most of their wealth. In some cases, they did. Some guys were just very well. In the property industry, especially in commercial, if you want to do deals, you need to be very well connected. If you're not well connected, so if you, if you don't have the money, but you're well connected, you can do deals. Yeah. You'll find a way to do deals. But if you're not well connected and you don't have the money, it's very hard. So I used to see a lot of the guys, because uh, remember in the commercial, the bank doesn't give you 100% finance. It's always 70%, 70 60%, 60%, 80%. Yeah. And that's what deters a lot of people. It's what prevents them from getting involved in the industry. So my belief is always, you know what, rather build a cash flow source that can fund your commercial or property aspirations. Because I experienced this firsthand. I had a job, I was earning a decent salary, and I was taking my money, investing it into property. But property, as you know, is a long-term investment. When you pump 100,000 into a property or 200,000 into a property for whatever reason, costs, renovation, uh, uh, expenses, uh, you know, all these things that you need, your money is now stuck in there. And if you can't refinance it for whatever reason, your money is stuck. It's stuck, yeah. You, you understand? Yeah. So that's where, that's where the problems arise, which means you need a cash flow generator that can constantly be spitting out Even cash Even if the you. money is stuck, you're still making some money you, elsewhere. Yes, because you know, as long as you're not losing money on the property, so if you cash positive on a property, it's fine, but you realize that now to do your next one, the ideal thing is either to refinance, take the money, then put it into the next deal. Mm. But what if you can't do that? What yeah. if you can't? I, I, have a, I have someone that emailed me literally yesterday. The person did a multi-let. They uh, didn't formalize it. So here's what, here, here's what happened. The person basically took a house. They bought a house. They converted it, spent 400,000 rand. Into a multi-let. It into yeah. a multi-let. Put multiple tenants in there. Now they're collecting X amount of rental. Yeah. Went to the bank, wanted to refinance it. The bank, bank asked them, where's the plans? The plans were done, but they were not approved. Yeah, and where's they, the rezoning? Then they told him, you need to rezone now. Yeah. It's a big problem. So now this person is stuck. You have to wait another year until you get the rezoning. Yes, but now uh, the problem also now with the rezoning, when I looked at the cash flow, it won't be worth a while. Because when I looked at the rental, the rates and taxes on that house, plus water and everything is already 4,000. Mm-hmm. What, once, what happens once you rezone? Your rates and taxes go up. Yeah, according to the value of the property, the new value of the property. You understand? So now you you have a problem here. You Mm. see? Mm. So the person, if you have a good job and you can fund those shortfalls, which should never be the case, because if you start funding negative cash flow properties, you're digging yourself into a hole. At some point, 
the house of cards is going to collapse and you're going, going to, to you're, going to, you're going to come out short. Yeah. Cash is king. Cash flow is king. You understand? So for that reason, you need to be very, very careful with, with those types of properties. You have to think twice because if you can't refinance, you're stuck. But if you had a cash cow outside of that business, outside mm -hmm. of that investment, then you're like, okay, I do have a cash cow and maybe I can just pump a little bit more equity into this deal on the bond. Because what I also noticed on this particular person's deal, the, the bond is very high. It should not be that high. So that person would probably have to pump Was some cash. Was it an cash. interest rate issue or what? Probably interest rates because interest rates are higher. Uh, yeah. You understand? Because I, did, I couldn't understand. For a multi-let, normally you should be positive. Or the person bought at a price that's too high or they overcapitalized when they renovated. Because 400000 into that probably sounds like a lot to me. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. But when you, so that's what was happening to us. We would buy these properties. We would put in the transfer costs, the, you know, if we needed to renovate, maybe do up the kitchens and, you know, but now you spend that money. Now you, now you, you're renting it out. Great. But now where do you get capital for the next round? Yeah. You've put 200,000, 300,000 into stuck that in thing. It's stuck. Yeah. And I learned, I learned this from one of my biggest mentors in this game. That person doesn't like to see his money get stuck in a deal for years. He wants his money to be in and out within months. Yeah. And you can't do that with property. You can't do that. So the guys that were consistently able to build and expand their portfolios were the guys that had other cash flow sources, other businesses that were generating them cash. Yeah. So that's why you'll see in my content, why do I show people how to start, say, a business? or where to find products to start a business. Because I'm trying to say you need a cash cow. I call it a cash cow. Build the cash cow. Build your cash cow. Because a lot of people that come to maybe even you and me, you know, and they, they'll, they'll tell you, I have 50,000. I want to invest. I want a hundred thousand. I have a hundred thousand. I want to invest. So basically they're That's saying, one deal and I, then your money is I want to pack the money in the deal because you're yeah. going to pack it for yes. a couple of months before you start making Now you money. ask yourself, that 100,000, how long did it take that guy to save up that 100,000? It probably took him years. Unless yeah. he has a very good job and it took him a few months. But in most cases, it took them years to save up that money. You know, so now you put it into a property deal that is not going to generate cash immediately. So if the person is low on cash and they don't have a very good cash flow source, like from a, a high paying job, what is better for them? A property investment or a business investment that can... Gener because remember, if you buy this cup and you, and you go and sell it, this money is coming back to you next week. Yeah. Your return on your capital is a lot faster. Whereas if you go and buy a property, we know it's a 10 year investment. Yeah. You know, so whenever we invest, even if it gives you immediate mm. cash flow, um, I mean, you have to have multiple of those. I mean, multiple. One, one unit is not going to make one a millionaire. No way. Unless they take that money, refinance it, keep investing in other. Yes. businesses as well to grow the portfolio so yes yeah, so the, and it, it, so it's for that reason that i'm like yes property can make you wealthy but for most people if they're coming from a background where maybe they just have a little bit of capital maybe it's better for them to first get into a business yeah or get into a deal as opposed to maybe going and uh, taking your 50 grand and putting it in to one deal that you're doing on your own maybe rather partner with investors where there's only 20 grand needed to get into a deal at least you didn't spend all your cash yeah. So you know? it can be too prompt whereby mm. what I'm hearing from you, take some of it, put it in a business, take some of it, put it in a deal. Yes. The business is generating the money weekly, monthly, daily, whatever. Yes. And then this one is your long-term source of income. Yes. Because that's what property has been and always will be. It's a long-term investment. My partner always, when he speaks to me, he always says in 10 years time, this property is going to be making X amount of money because there'll be no bond. He's always thinking long-term, long-term, yeah. you know? So property is a long-term investment. It's not something you think of now, now, now. So then if it's long-term, why do you always say make positive cash flow? Now. Because positive cash flow, so you at least don't have to pay the bank. Okay. Because, uh, you, because you don't want to be paying out of your pocket for any investment. You want to pay zero. You want to pay investment. zero. Because remember, a, a property could be, let's say, I'll give you an example. We just took transfer of a property literally two days ago. This property, after paying the bond, will probably net about, interest rates have gone up now. I would say maybe 8,000 a month. But can 8,000 sustain me? No. A month? No. 
but it's a big purchase. It's a big purchase. But in a couple of years, as those rentals escalate, then it becomes more meaningful. Right now, I'm also working on that property. I'm, putting, I'm working on putting in a cell phone tower. Uh, yesterday, they told me that should bring us about 15, we're expecting 15 to 16,000 on the cell phone tower. We're putting up a, a ball. Mm-hmm. So instead of the money now going to the council for the, the council, water, we yeah. collect it. So that will bring us another, I don't know, 10,000, depending on the water bill that was being paid. And then we're putting up a, a digital billboard. We're putting up a billboard. So that might make another 10. So automatically now I'll look at my cash flow. So when, when we buy property, we all, I, I'm not looking only at the property cash flow as it stands now. If that property doesn't have the potential for me to increase the cash flow even more, yeah. should I be buying it? No. You know, because no, it's only going to make me five or six or seven thousand. Yeah. But if I can get these other things in, which is then putting the bulb is not going to cost me any money. Putting the cell phone tower is not going to cost me any money, but it's immediate return. So now immediately that five or six thousand rand that we were making, now we're making twenty six, thirty six thousand a month. Mm-hmm. On the now it becomes meaningful. You understand? Yeah. So that's how 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 you should be thinking about it. But the cash outlay to put into that deal was significant, because the bank didn't give a hundred percent bond. Yeah. So the deposit was was huge. Yeah. Which a lot of people wouldn't be able to raise that kind of money. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about the kind of mindset and management skills mm-hmm. that are required to run a property investment portfolio or to grow it. Because, you know, a lot of guys like you and I would, would be online and say, invest in property. Mm. But what you forget to tell people is that it takes a lot of work to manage a portfolio. Manage mm. one tenant, yeah, that's fine. But to manage 50, 100, mm. 20, that's not as easy as it looks. Can you talk more on that? And, and you see, this is where I also want to again say why I, I, I'm, I'm steering more towards commercial. Because when we're speaking about tenants, we're speaking about residential tenants. Yeah. That's why a lot of people's veil has been removed. Yes. Right? Mm. Now we are removing their veil on the commercial mm. side. Yeah. But a lot of them, their veil is more removed yeah. on the residential. That's the biggest reason know. I sold my properties was because of the management issues I was sometimes having. Yeah. I had 10 units. And in some cases, I brought on partners to invest with me on the deal. They brought in the capital, but I, I ran the deal. I currently have nine units on the market right now. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> you're selling as one portfolio, but okay. they're all in one development, which is okay. good. Yeah. Okay. So w- when I when I had those ones, I, w- I was the guy managing everything. I was running the rentals. I was managing the payments and everything. And I had a full time job as a banker at that time, and that gave me stress. When I tell you I had stress, I had stress. You don't see these gray hairs here for nothing. Yeah. You know, that's when I realized this year you, you, there needs to be a, a very you know, you need to put a manager in place. But the problem with residential, sometimes your rental income is not enough to add a managing agent into the deal. Yeah, because 10% then, becomes a lot. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the managing agent wants 7 8%. Some of them want 10%. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, you negative cash flow. So, for that reason, in some most cases, I couldn't put a managing agent. I had to run the stuff. So, when I sold all my residential and I said, now I'm going into commercial... It's because I realized if you, if you and I buy an industrial property, mm. right? Compare this. You have residential. Who's responsible for the maintenance? I am. You are. Mm. So if something is broken there, who's going to have to go fix it? You. Yeah. In an, in an industrial property, do you think your tenant is going to wait for you to come yeah. fix a light bulb or something? No, no. No, no. he's going to do it on his own. We've done office space before. Most yeah. of the time. Uh, the tenant is the one that actually revamps the entire unit. Exactly. The they don't have the time they to work in a certain way. Yes. Yeah. The toilet is broken. Do you think they're going to call you? No, no of course. They'll, they want to use the toilet. Yes, they'll fix it. They might tell you, listen, I fixed the toilet over here, but uh, I'm going to send you the bowl or whatever. Yeah, no problem. Which solves your maintenance and management issues to a certain degree. And in some cases with commercial property, you can actually put it in the lease that the tenant is responsible for those things. You can do that, but you can't do that in residential. So when it comes to management, you need to have thick skin if you're going to be a residential landlord. And no one speaks about that. Yes, all the gurus are saying, get into property, get into property. My friend, what about the management of those units? Uh, I mentioned to you before our session, 
the, un- the, the building we just bought, I told the manager, the guy who's going to be managing it, I said, I don't want to know anything about the tenants. I don't want to know who got divorced. I don't want to know who <laughs> lost their jobs. Because I found when I was doing that work, I would become emotionally involved in the tenants' problems. Yeah. And it cost me a lot of money because some te- they'll take advantage of you where they can. They won't pay. So, so and- being emotional costs money. No, I'm, I'm a landlord. I'm not a psychologist. You understand? So you need to have a very thick skin if you're going to do that, that game. Mm-hmm. And the more units you have, the more stressful it becomes. Yeah, it multiplies. And even if you have a managing agent for a residential portfolio, it's still your building. Because I've seen buildings, just there's one right now that we are looking at. The owners, and this is not even a, a, it's a commercial. It's only got one residential unit. And it's so badly managed by the managing agent. The owner has relocated, he's living in the United States. Yeah, but the building with deteriorate because you're not looking at your building. But you've got a managing agent. The managing agent has allowed the tenants to go into arrears. They're in arrears with a managing agent. So I sometimes see people leaving comments, I'll just get a managing aid. No, the managing, you're passing responsibility onto the managing. It's your unit. It's your property. It's your responsibility. It doesn't matter if you have a managing agent. So as a potential uh, or prospective property investor, always remember the buck stops with you. You are still ultimately responsible. So if, if people, you, you have to look at your personal circumstances. If you have a full-time job or you're a professional, like I have doctors that reach out to me and they want to invest in property. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy is a doctor. Does he have the time to be concerned about this tenant and that tenant didn't pay? Most of the time, no. No, he doesn't have the time. So should he be actually in, in investing in residential? He should be buying commercial, commercial. properties yes. and converting them into practices so that he can run or just of get uh, from just get uh, commercial buildings in general. Go invest. Take uh, I, I my dentist. Right he, uh, when it was COVID, they were <laughs> selling. I was on the. <laughs> table yeah uh, just i think it was after covid or whatever i was on the table with the dentist and guess what he what he said to me uh don't you because he knew i'm in property he's like hey man i need to sell this building we uh, there's a few of us that own a building it's a block of flats in florida we need to get rid of it and he's asking me to help him get rid of it yeah because it's too stressful because he needs to run his practice you know so you need to take your personal circumstances into account if you're going to get into residential that's why I'm, I say stay away from CBD. Most people yeah, have you jobs. always say that. Yeah. yeah, most people have jobs. Now you're going to invest in CBD. You must, you must go collect rent yourself. No, no, no. That's very, it, it's dangerous, number one. And number two, now you're becoming too involved in this thing. You know, so look at your personal circumstances. Don't take on invest an investment that's going to kill your lifestyle. Yeah. And that's what I was finding. Sometimes the bigger my portfolio was growing, a Saturday afternoon, instead of it being family time, would be me sure. taking my family, going to the unit, making sure that they fix the toilet and all these things. You know, that's what your life becomes as I a landlord. I that's part of teaching the kids uh, what, what the responsibility is. Your kids will never want that job. They'll never want it. If you read Donald Trump's book, The Art of the Deal. Yeah, his so, father never allowed him to go no, on site for many years. No, his, oh, father, he no, his father was actually the owner of a bunch of blocks of flats in the New York slums. Mm. And he said, when they used to collect the rent, it's in that book, he says, when we used to collect the rent, often we would have to knock on the door and then you stand to the side of the door in case a bullet came through the door. And he said to himself, I don't want to be involved in, in, in this business. He made the decision. That is why what he did was he went and he built Trump Tower. He said, I want to service the higher end of the market, not this end of the market. I don't want to do the CBD. I want to do the sentence of I want to be incentive. I want to be incentive. I want to be that developer. You understand? Yeah. So think with the end in mind. Before you make sometimes we're thinking about making an investment only for the money. We're not thinking about if I make this investment, what does it look like? I remember when I was investing in the fast food franchise, I made a decision out of money. Mm. Because my my What did goal, you see? I mean, there might be someone mm. now wanting to buy a franchise yeah. and we're not saying people should and it's up mm. to them. Yeah. But what happened with that? So with the franchise, there was, a, there, were, there was a strategic intent with the franchise. I had 10 properties, but I wanted to quit my job. And these, the idea was once I have 10 properties, it's supposed to be making me enough money so I can quit my job. But I wasn't, I wasn't able to do that. 
And I, what I found was, guess what I found? I wasn't making enough cash flow. I needed to pay off these properties as soon as possible. So I thought if I invest my money in my franchises, in franchises, because I found out, uh, you know, these fish and chips were like, they were like new that time, 09, 2010. So we opened ours in 2011. Yeah. But by that time, they were Just sort after of, the World Cup. Yeah. But by that time, they were starting to already go down, you know, and I didn't realize that. But the first store did well. So I went in there thinking that if I invest in the franchise, it's going to spit out 20, 30,000 rand cash every month. And then I'm going to take that money and I'm going to pump it into my property investments to bring down the debt so that I can have more cash flow because then that's passive income, right? And it didn't work out like that because with the, with the, with the franchise, if I, if I had looked at the people that had businesses like that, I would have realized why I shouldn't have one like that. Mm. Think with the end in mind. So when I got the franchise, guess what my Saturdays once again were? I had to sit in the shop. You have to be there. So now I'm working and Monday to Friday in the bank. Yeah. And then uh, even though my wife was running the stores, Friday night wasn't family night in front of the TV or going out. No. Friday mm. night was the family being in the shop all the time. We didn't have, there was no holidays, man. Even when we went on holiday, I remember we went on one holiday to Durban, just my wife and I, because I just felt she needed a break, but she was still on the bed, on the laptop, you know, placing orders and people will say, oh, just get a manager. The buck stops with you. When it we try to put managers in, they stole the money. They stole the money. It you becomes know? counterproductive. Y yes. So if, if, if you're going to go that route, all I can say is, and I learned this from a very successful person who owns franchises, not, I'm not talking these small ones, like big franchises, like spas and ocean baskets and things. And he said to me, one of your mentors as well, one of my clients, one of your clients. Yeah. 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 Ah, <laughs> see, I told you. Mentor. Yeah. yeah. And he, he said to me, uh, cause I said to him, I would love to own things like this. He said, if you ever own stuff like this here, make sure your manager has a share in your business. Let him put his own money into there as well. Then he won't steal from you. He says on the ones where, uh, where he didn't do that, the managers always stole the money. But when he made them buy a share into the business, then they, and it could be a small share, it can be 10%. He says when they bought shares or they were uh, shareholders in the business, mm -hmm. then he said the business did well. Then he didn't have as many issues. So that's, uh, that's the main thing is like, if you're going to go into franchising and you have a full, like, that's why I, I'm very big on online businesses. You'll see my content. I'm always start trying to steer people to Towards online the online. business. Yeah. There's a reason for that because I realized that if you have a full-time job, now you go open a franchise or some sort of traditional business. How are you going to run it? Because any business requires your attention. Yeah. If you're going into construction, you need to be there. If you're opening a takeaway, you need to be there. If you're opening a supermarket, you need to be there. Yeah. You know, otherwise yeah. uh, you, you, your stock and things is not going to be well managed. You know, uh, and if you get it right, then good for you. Some people have managed to find ways to do that. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is that now everything boils down to mm. management, yeah. whether you are working or you have a business mm -hmm. or you have a property investment portfolio. The end in mind is, will I be able to manage this thing? Yeah. Always think with the end in mind, because think about what are you buying? What will the, what will your life look like if you are highly successful doing exactly what you're doing? So once again, if I speak about the franchises, I wanted to have five stores. I eventually had two. If I had just sat back and I looked at the guy, next, the, the guy who had a store next to me, guess what I noticed only when I had my store? Mm -hmm. I noticed this man is always in his shop. Every day. All I needed to do was look at him and I was like, but this guy is here every day. Which means I'm going to have to be here every day. Mm. So you know? which kills the concept of passive income. It kills the concept of and passive income. And freeing up time. Yes. You know, one guy said to me, said, witness, if you want to make a lot of money in business, mm. find a business that you can put systems in and free up all your time. Yeah. Then you have more time to go look at other businesses. Yes. If, if you find a business that's going to need you to be there all the time, mm. it means it's taking up all your thinking and your creativity. That's why I think, with, I'm not saying all franchises, I think there's a reason a McDonald's and a, and a KFC, for example, cost the money that they do. It's I the think big they, ones, the systems. Yes, you're buying an actual system. But yeah. for these small ones that come out, you think you're buying a system, but I mean, even the likes of our debonairs and steers, they won't give you a store if you're not going to be an owner manager. They want you to be an owner so manager. So what's, yeah. what's the point? Am I not buying your system then? 
Yeah. You're supposed to be they selling me a system that works They want you me. to be an owner manager. Exactly. You know, but they have found that the most successful stores are the ones where the owner is actively involved. Yeah. Which is fine if you want that life. It's famous brands, right? Famous brands, yeah. yeah. So if you want that life, then it's fine. Then go ahead and do that. But think with the end in mind. So if that's not the life you want. So if you want to build a property portfolio and you're going to go and buy a ton of units in CBD, are you going to build a lifestyle that you want? Yeah, because all you need to go do is look at other CBD owners and see if they're sitting on the beach collecting checks. True. Or are they running around trying to get people out of their buildings because it's hijacked? Mm -hmm. You understand? What I love about what you're saying is even though you are buying into like a franchise or buying mm -hmm. a franchise, be willing to at least give shares to the manager. Not give, but there's 10%. Yeah, well, you can, if, if that's the route you want to take. Or, or you can, yeah, there's different structures you could do. If the person doesn't have the money maybe to buy the shares, maybe they, maybe they only have a certain amount to buy a very small share. Then you tell them, okay, you know what, I'll give you, say, 15 or 20%. Mm -hmm. But maybe as you pay them, they buying their share from there. Maybe you work at an arrangement. Over a period of time. Yeah, so it's almost like they're paying in from their salary. So let's say you're paying the guy 15 Gs. Yeah. Maybe you say, okay, you know what? We agree that for you to buy this share is going to cost you X. And then maybe you deduct from the money that maybe you're paying. Maybe they make an arrangement like that. Find a way to structure it in so that the guy can have a share in the business, a small share. So just so he feels a sense of ownership that mm. by me building this, I'm building my wealth. Yeah. So make your you would need to make your managers your partners instead of your just your managers. Then Absolutely. I think you build a more successful model. Sure. Think about the franchisor. I always say if you're ever going to go into franchising, become the franchisor. You must the be the franchisor. Yeah, of course. But what does a franchisor do? He's partnering with you. He's partnering with you. He's making you his partner. Yeah. But do you just get in for free? He has a shop. No, you or pay. Or do you need to pay it? You pay. It. You, you pay. pay him for And you're totally responsible for it and he gets paid. He gets He's the passive, passive income. income. He gets the passive income. Yeah. So uh, to start those types of businesses cost a lot of money. If, you, well, if you're going to be that type of entrepreneur, it's going to cost you. Because if you want to start a franchise of your own, you need to come up with a pilot store that you're going to, because you need to show the concept, right? Yeah. So it's going to cost you a couple hundred thousand, a million. And you rand, still have to on, be there every day. Then you need to be there to show that it's a winning concept. Then you have your three, four stores. Now when the concept takes off, now you become the franchisor and you sell the concept. That's a lot of money and it's a lot of time. So why am I such a big supporter of online? Mm. Because as a full-time, most people are working full-time that want to start businesses. There's a lot of people that are frustrated in their, in their jobs. So does that guy have the time to go open that sort of business, to go around the franchise, get it off the ground? No, he'll have to leave his job to do that. Whereas to me, with an online business, you can work on that thing in the evening. You can work on it from home. You can work on it from your cell phone. You can work on it when you're sitting at the coffee shop during your lunch break at your job. Yeah. You know, so that to me is the beauty of, uh, of online businesses. That's why I'm, I'm so big on them. Because I just find that it's, it's better for people to go that route. Whereas if they're going to go, to, uh, I, I started my very first business, which we didn't cover was actually, I, I used to sell car sound. Car sound. I used to put subwoofers in cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to go into the town. That, that must have been big business in the 2000s. Eh? Uh, the early 2000. 2004, five. Guess what? Guess what, was, guess what was my marketing I used to strategy? I car like that, that, is, yeah. that it's sound and everything. Yeah, I saw. I, I, man, I went to competitions, man. I brought home trophies with my sound. Yeah. I was serious about that thing. I was in my 20s and I was like, ah, this thing, I'm going to do it. You know, but guess what was my marketing strategy? I used to go to Soweto, go stand by the busiest spot, put my car sound on, and it makes a noise there, makes all the shutters rumble there in the centers. Yeah. And, and then the I give out pamphlets. Ah, say, I, I, I give out my pamphlets. I'm like, come see me there. You, you, I'll put sound for you. That was my business. So that business, to start that little tiny business from my garage, Cost me 40,000 rand back then to buy stock, setting it up in the garage. You know? So you sound, you sound like somebody who's got a very strong mindset um, and also willing to share knowledge with people. Mm. Where does that strong mindset come from? I know you need to be closing, but mm. I just want to tap into your mindset a little bit because mm. somebody might be watching and saying, I want to be like Aslam, but mm. do you have his mindset? It, and where does that strong mindset come it, from? I think it's from doing the things that other people were not willing to do. Most people won't go sign up in a network marketing company. 
You know, network marketing has a very bad reputation. Because uh, you talk about recruiting people and, you know, mm. it's just got that people. And sales is taken. Yeah, and pyramid and scheme and all these things. But when I joined a company like that in 2014, we went through a lot of personal development. So the, the learning I was doing before I got into that from the books was one aspect, but I didn't continue my learning. I didn't have a mentor that was teaching me what to learn, what, you know. And then when I got into that, we used to go for a lot of seminars. I went to seminars overseas and a lot locally. And they were teaching us this concept of mindset and having a vision and having a goal and, you know, having a positive mindset. Because one of the things I learned is that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, bless his soul, he passed away, I think either this year or the beginning of last year. His name was Bob Proctor. Yeah. And Bob Proctor. The father of management. Yeah. Um, no, you, I, I don't think he was called the father of management. He was very big uh, on personal development. Yeah, personal, yeah. But his whole thing was he had this concept where he says, every day you get stimuli from the, the environment. Your friends are talking to you. Your father's talking to you. Your colleagues are talking to you. So all this information is coming through your ears, your eyes, right? It's going into your mind. Now, when it gets into your mind, we've got two parts in the mind, the conscious and the subconscious. So when it comes in immediately, when I teach you how to fix something, I'm putting it into your conscious mind because you're still learning how to do it. But if I teach, teach it to you over and over and over and over and over, eventually it moves to your subconscious mind where you now can do it automatically. You don't think about driving. Do you need to think about how to put the, uh, when you're driving, are you thinking, I need to push the clutch, then I need to put it in gear, or are you doing it unconsciously? It's unconscious. So the yeah. conscious learning took place when your father, or whoever taught you how to drive, was telling you, put in the clutch, then put it in first, then let go of the clutch, press the accelerator and start moving. That was conscious learning. Subconscious uh, mind learning or subconscious, when, it, when that skill is in your subconscious, you do it unconsciously. You are now unconsciously competent. So what he was basically saying is when the information comes in, every bit of information that you get in, right, it generates an emotion inside of you. So if I play a song for you right now, right, and I'm getting, uh, you asked me the question of the mindset, I'm giving you the yep, answer. And I'm listening. Right? So if I play the song for you now and it was a, yeah, it's not quite though anymore now. It's I'm a piano, right? That's now the new thing, yeah. right? Or house. What's your, what's your feeling or your instinct to get up and dance and jive, right? Because it's putting you in a good mood, right? But if I start putting on love songs now for you, are you going to, you gonna, maybe you're going to, especially if I play a love song, maybe from your teenage years when this girl broke your heart, <laughs> you're going to be like, hey, that day, man, you know, hey, that girl, she broke, you're going to, you know, it puts you in a bad mood. So what do we tend to do when, when we have a bad breakup with someone? We go put sad songs on. Mm. Now, when you're feeling all sad and depressed, do you feel like doing anything? No. No. So what Bob Proctor taught us was that when you have something coming into your mind and it becomes an emotion, that emotion dictates what you'll do with your hands, your actions. Your emotions will dictate your actions. So what I found when I used to go for all those seminars and those trainings and everything, have you ever been to a seminar, right? You'll know when you come out there, you're motivated. You feel like, man, I can, I, I can, go, I can go and fight with a, a heavyweight boxer now the way I'm so motivated. You, you know, because you feel inspired now to take action. So the secret to having that mindset is being able to get yourself into that, 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 that action uh, mindset all the time. Because every day is not the same. Some days you fight with your spouse, your boss tells you nonsense. You, you know, you have these emotional roller coasters. This is the information now coming into your brain. But now it's not what happens to you. It's how you react to what happens to you. So to get the mindset of doing what you and I are doing as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur is every day an up day. No, some days you're down. So first you need to work on your mindset where you need to be able to get yourself in a positive space so you can take action all the time. So I always tell people, what are you doing every day? I see you have muscles there. So I can see this guy goes to the gym. You understand? Mm -hmm. So if you want to build a muscle, you go to the gym. So if you want to build your mind, what must you do? You go to books. Yeah. You listen to also a muscle. That's how you build your mind. But you need, so the secret is put positive things constantly into your mind through what you're learning, through the books, through the people you listen to, through the people you get around. One of my uh, mentors used to always used to say it as a joke eventually. He said, you become the average of the five people you spend all your time with. So if your five best friends are broke, Guess who's best friend number, uh, guess who's broke friend number six? 
It's you. It's you. <laughs> and it, that broke doesn't necessarily only mean in money. It means in mindset. Mm. So are you hanging around with the people that are speaking about their problems or are you hanging around the people that are speaking about ideas? Are you hanging around people that are speaking about things that we can do? When you messaged me, I was already thinking, this guy thinks like me. Maybe he and I can do business in the future. Yeah. You see, because Absolutely. like, why did you call me? Because like attracts I like. like. That's my guy. You understand? You, you, so we attract each other. So when, when I'm looking for, for, not even when I'm looking, when, I, when people are coming to me or for you for coaching, I interview them because I'm not looking for everyone. I want to know I can work with this person. This person must have been attracted to me and I must be attracted to them in, a, in terms of mindset that we can work together. Because hmm. you can't take the unwilling to drink water. What do they say? You can take the horse to water, but you can't make him Force drink. It to drink yeah. I don't even want to take the horse to the water. He must pitch up in the water and I'm like, I'm hungry, give me the water. I'm thirsty, give me the water. Yeah. My job is not to, to help you get to the water. That's your job. And how do you do that? Books. Listening to the right people, listening to the right podcasts, like the one we're on right now. Getting this positivity in your mind every day. And that is going to build the entrepreneurial mindset. Sure. That's what I've always noticed about entrepreneurs. They can be having down days, but there's no time to be down. They need to be upbeat all the time. So even when things are bad, they still upbeat. They still upbeat. Your two favorite quotes? You, I think I've given you a lot. Huh? I think I've given you a lot. There's, uh, there's one about the one that you talked about and mm. something about an ignorant. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a good one. Right. So uh, ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. So when people ask me, how do I get into business? Where do I start? I say, just start. Just start. Are you waiting to do a business plan? Because many people, they'll come to you, like I, I get messages. I have so much money. What business must I start? I don't know. Go start something at least. Because you, you're looking to give, for me to give you the answer. So if I tell you start selling cosmetics and then if the cosmetics business doesn't work out, then who are you going to blame? Aslam. You're going to blame Aslam. <laughs> no, go start something that you are passionate about. I feel, so here's the business I feel the person should start. This year, can I speak to the camera? Yeah. This is the business you should start. You should start a business around something you either have a passion for, an interest, or a, a previous education or experience. That's the business you should start. Because that you can start, guess what, without any money. Because the knowledge is already here. And yeah. then you can turn that into an online business. Because somewhere, if you know how to, like you're a property guy, you've died, you're doing multi-lets, right? So if, if you were coming to me and you were saying, hey, you know what, I'm doing multi-lets, but I need to diversify my income. I'll immediately be like, what have you done? What are your interests? Okay, your interests are property. I'll be like, okay, and you've already, I'm just speaking if you uh, not yeah. you, what you're doing now. I'd be like, maybe you should write a book. Maybe you should start a podcast and start giving people your knowledge. Maybe you should start a blog. Maybe you should be running courses and things like that, you know, to teach people what it is that you know. Because those are things you can start without any money. Everything else, where it comes to buying products, you need capital to buy those products. Absolutely. You know, so I say start with the things that are already in your mind. And you, you don't need to be the most experienced guy. You and I spoke about this. You said to me earlier, I don't know if we were on, on the we're, air. Yeah, we're not on air yet. You said to me, uh, you know, sometimes you meet people, they have more experience than you, but they're not doing the things you're doing. Why? Because they maybe just don't have, they, they, they're keeping the knowledge on ice. You are just maybe ignorance on fire and you're like, I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure it out. Sure. So that's also my philosophy. You know, don't try and figure things out. Just start. If you fail, so what? You learn something from it. Hmm. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Mr. Aslam Titoit. He says, start. Start. Hmm. Don't ask what kind of business can you get into because you've got some money. He doesn't know. He's saying go start. And what I love about that is that he explained, he came back and said, I don't know, but here are the areas where you can start. Somewhere where you're passionate, where you know you've got the knowledge, where there's easy reach for you in terms of your skills and you can teach your skills to other people. More mm. specifically, because you can take that, put it online. Mm. If you don't think that's value, I don't know what value is. Comment, let us know what your thoughts are. 
Follow him. Where can people follow you before we go? Where okay. can people follow you? So, I know you've got the property deal maker. So yes, on uh, Facebook. So, okay, so on Facebook it's the property deal maker. That's the page. On uh, YouTube, TikTok, it's all Aslam Dutoy. If you just search Aslam Dutoy YouTube, I'm more active on TikTok these days. I love the algorithm there. Yeah, you know it's <laughs> uh, it's crazy. Uh, and then uh, AslamDutoy.com. I've got a website. It's AslamDutoy.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it from us. Remember to subscribe, like, click on the notifications bell and share the video with as many people as you can so that more people can gain knowledge. All right, that's it from us. It's more than just money. Ciao, ciao. Yeah, but you must remember to remove the one about the pool. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. 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 Yeah.